Shalom, beloveds of the King. Praise Abba Yahuwah for his grace and his love and his mercy that we are able to come and look at this wonderful book, this prophetic book that has poetry, that has a way of Yeshayahu speaking that really it takes Abba Yahuwah's grace to be able to unlock what it is that Yahu is having to speak. And so I just praise the Father because you know what? I really have to humble myself before him. And that is why I thank him. I thank him from the bottom of my heart. I thank him with the very core of my from the very core of my being because he is the only one that is able to give the insight, that is able to reveal the, the deeper things that he wants to speak in this magnificent book. A book that is not only just speaking to the time that it was in that time, which Yeshayahu Isaiah was a very, very powerful prophet, very powerful prophet of his time. But he is speaking very prophetically to where we are today. And so let us pray. Abba Yahuam, I just want to thank you, my Father. Father, truly I humble myself before you. As truly it is only by your grace, Abba Yahuwah, that you are able to get me to be able to bring your revelation of this powerful prophetic book. Abba, I just want to thank you because in the, through the pages of this book we learn so many ways that is the way you deal with things, the way you are speaking, what you are saying and what are you saying to us in this hour. And you are so faithful because that which you said, you, would, you do. That which was prophesied here truly happened as it was spoken. And so once again, this is again an example for us to understand that if you say you will do a thing, you will do it. You have decreed it, you have spoken it, and therefore you will do it. And who are we to think otherwise or to say otherwise? We All we need to do is be willing and obedient servants to hear the cry of your heart and to be able to do what it is to shama, to listen, to obey, to put your word into practice. We are not supposed to be just the hearers of the word where we can quote every chapter and verse. But the most important thing is how much of this Bible are we willing to put into practice? And this is the time that we are living in now, is that we do not study these things to acquire more knowledge, to say, wow, let me tick my little box. Wow, I read the whole book of Jeremiah and now I'm going to read the whole book of Isaiah and to come and tick a box. But it's for us to be able to understand your heart, what you are saying, and what can we learn from what you have already spoken and what you have already done with these wicked nations that would continue to stand against you. And may this be as a warning to us to think that we too need to walk circumspectly before you. And so I thank you, Abba Yahuwah, that you will just continue to search our hearts, my Father. Search our, search our hearts so that we may be able to walk before you with humbled hearts. Allow our hearts, shine your light in our hearts so that we can see what is there that will not be pleasing to you. And so I thank you, Father, that you open up this revelation of this chapter 16 to us today so that we may be able to understand your deeper message from this chapter. 
speak to my mind and speak through my lips the very oracles that will come from your heart in the name of Yoshua. I thank you for this, Abba. Amen. And so praise Abba Father that we continue with the prophecy that Abba Yahuwah has spoken over Moab, the Moabites. And we are to remember, as I spoke yesterday and I gave a little bit of the history, and it's important once again for us to be able to understand the significance of this history, because at the end of the day, everything that has to do with this people of Moab are a people that was birthed. Can you imagine, this is just what I was thinking about, you know, as I was working through this, is that, you know, the daughters of Lot saw the hand of the Father in the most magnificent way. That these angels came and delivered them from the hand of destruction. That they were this only family that came out alive from two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, the only family. They saw what happened to their mother when she decided to look back. She was pulverized and turned into a pillar of salt. And now these two young ladies with everything that they see, the magnitude of the power of the Father, will still in their own fleshly ways, because of what they've come out of in Sodom and Gomorrah, that they came out of this evil surrounding surroundings of people, people whose way of thinking, living, acting, everything was contrary to the way of Yahuwah. But yet Lot would have been a righteous man that was speaking righteously. And so they would have been brought up in a home knowing how to put their trust and their faith in their Yah. Yet they chose to sleep with their father to satisfy the lust of their own flesh. To do what was right in their own eyes. As opposed to if they just came out of a a city, they just came out of another place, they went into the mountains, so there would have been other men. And so this is why we must understand the root of Moab is everything that comes from a flesh nature that acts and does and wills and thinks in their own flesh way. Not submitted and surrendered to Abba Yahuwah. And that is why there is such a, a, a wonderful testimony of Ruth, a Moabite. The difference between Ruth and Orpah. Orpah decided to go back to her people and to her ways. She chose the way of the flesh. She chose to go back. And not stay with them, her mother-in-law. But chose to go back to her people, to her flesh way. Back to a people that her ancestry eventually would have been destroyed. But Ruth made another decision. The decision to bow her knee. To say your people will be my people and your Yah will be my Yah. Which means I will follow you. I will follow the ways of your people. I will follow what your people have been taught because your people have the only true living owl. And therefore your Yahuwah will be my Yahuwah and I will follow him. And I will follow his ways. And I will be obedient to his precepts, to his ordinances, to his Torah law ways. And this is the decision that the Father is wanting from a people. Will we be like Ruth, 
who comes from a horrific bloodline. From women that will be so easily allowing themselves to be used and abused as prostitutes. Incestuous people. Yet, Ruth chose a different way. And this is the story that we are still looking at as we continue with chapter 16 with the decree, with the prophetic word that was coming out of Yeshaya, whose mouth, Isaiah, in order to bring judgment against Moab. So we continue to read. Send a lamb to the ruler of the land, from Sela to the wilderness, to the mountain of the daughter of Zion. And it shall be like a wandering bird, a nest thrown out. So are the daughters of Moab at the fords of Arnon. So here we see that the refugees of Moab that are in Sila are sending a lamb as a token of peace with the king of to the king of Yehuda in Zion. So here is this lamb. Interesting how if you look at um, the there's a lot of translations that they say they send the lambs because this is what the king of Moab used to do. He used to send up to a hundred thousand lambs to the king to King Ahab the king of Israel, as a token of peace between them for him to have favor. And this is read in Second Kings 3 verse 4, which we're not going to look into. And so now they're sending, so a lot of them say they send lambs, but it doesn't say if you go to the original, it says, send a lamb, one lamb. Very important. Bring counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcasts, do not betray him who escapes. Like I said, Isaiah was very poetic <laughs> the way he puts things is just so different it's not a straightforward book to read like jeremiah jeremiah was a very simplistic man spoke very simplistic way but isaiah was kind of a learned man and he's got a different way of putting things in a very prophetic type way um poetic almost so basically what he's saying is that their women are wandering birds that have been cast out of their nest. So they are like these wandering birds that have been cast out of their nest. And so in verse 3 and 4, we have a look and we says, so he says in verse 3, bring counsel, execute judgment, make your shadow like the night in the middle of the day. Hide the outcasts, do not betray him who escapes. So there is a remnant that is escaping, and this remnant that's escaping needs to find, they need to find asylum. And then verse 4 says, Let my outcasts dwell with you, O Moab. Be a shelter to them from the face of the ravager. For the oppressor has met his end. Destruction has ceased. Those trampling down have perished from the land. So here we see a great destruction that has been executed. And the only ones that are going to be protected are a remnant. And so we see verse 2 is very much like the woman that are wandering birds. So, you know, these are like wandering birds that have been cast out of their nest. They desperate, the desperate Moabites are seeking Judah's protection. 
Jerusalem would be a safe refuge that would be like a shadow that would protect them for a while. Isaiah advised Judah to accept these refugees as a sign of compassion during the enemy's time of devastation. And so when I started to pray about this, and that this really, because like I said, I really have to pray when it comes to this chapter so that, just, so that the Father can just give me some insight in what he's trying to say through this very poetic type of prophetic book. And you've got to read between the lines and see what is Isaiah trying to speak. And then comes verse 5. Verse 5 in the middle of nowhere, and this is what really made me think, because my Bible from verses 16 to verse, um, from chapter 16 from verses 1 to 5, is really future. So I thought, okay. And then comes verse 5 in the middle of nowhere, and it says, And in loving commitment, the throne shall be established, and one shall sit on it in truth. In the tent of David, judging and seeking right ruling and speeding righteousness. Now, wow. So now in the middle of this prophecy of destruction, and when he's talking to Judah, and he's saying, you need to give protection to this remnant of Moab. Wow. Yeah, he's speaking prophetic. And isn't it interesting, because if we really have a look at this, when I prayed about this, I said, Abba, what are you trying to show us here prophetically? Now listen. Abba will establish his throne, and one lamb will be given to Jerusalem. Who was the lamb that was given to Jerusalem? Who was the lamb that came to be able to bring peace for a remnant for those in exile? There was a lamb that was given to Jerusalem to say, we give you this as a token of peace. Please, will you give us asylum? As we need protection. We are like these birds. Wandering without a nest. So when we have a look at this. Wow. It showed me such a beautiful picture. Because just today. I had a phone call from my friends in Italy. And for many years. We have been together. And they are also going to Israel now. In September. And they are part of the group that I've been part of, of the Sephardic Jews, where we are the Sephardic Jews that are in exile at this point in time, in the nations, waiting to return back to our land. And so we are part of those lost tribes. And so we've been walking a path with each other now since 2011 when I met them, praying and seeking Abba for these Sephardic Jews that find themselves in exile throughout the different nations. And as we were discussing today and as I read this, as we were, you know, sharing and as I read this, it really just made so much sense to me. And so this is how the Father showed it to me. Abba will establish his throne. And one, a lamb, will be given to Jerusalem. He has been given on behalf of the exiles of the house of Israel. All those that are dispersed from their land, like birds, they are the outcasts of their nest. So they had a place, but they are now outcasts and they are dispersed throughout the nations of the world. 
But you see, there is a lamb that has been given to gather these outcasts, to gather these exiles. And he is the one that will give them protection. He's the one that gathers them. He's the one that will have com compassion on us. If we are those that have truly repented and come back into the fold and we have understood our wayward ways and we have understood our wicked ways and we have understood the way that we've gone astray, these exiles of the house of Israel that have gone astray, that have lost their way, that was in idolatry and absolutely everything that was like Moab, so it was like these exiles. We had gone astray and following our own way. And this was, understand, Lot is directly a descendant from Abraham, which is part of his people. But his own people, Moab, have gone astray. And so they will have his protection. He is the one that will have compassion on us during the time of, of the enemy's destruction on the nations. So understand, he will be the one to protect us. He is the lamb that has been given, that's come from Jerusalem to be able to stand in the gap for a people that are going to need protection in a time of when the greatest judgments are going to come upon the nations of the world. So wherever we find ourselves, he is the lamb that was given as a gift for the one that will be a peace offering for us in a time of destruction because of his loving kindness and his commitment and he will gather us and establish his throne his throne of loving commitment he is the one who will sit in truth in the tent of David judging and seeking right ruling and speeding righteousness So isn't this amazing, this the whole thing as the father opened it up to me and he said, you see my child, I don't only gather those of the house of Yehuda, but I gather the outcasts of the house of Israel. And even those that would be like a Moab, that are of the nations, that are maybe not even of the house of Israel, but they have been grafted in through the lamb that was already slain for you and for me. His blood has been shed and he is the one worthy to be praised. He is the one worthy to be exalted who has shed his blood. The one who has gone before us, the one who's going to protect us from the onslaught of the enemy upon the nations when the judgments are going to come. Because Isaiah is already praying and saying, you need to give them asylum, you need to give them protection in the time of the destruction. So there will be an escape of a protection of the ark of the Father's presence and so when we had a look, when I had a look at this, then verse Acts, chapter 15. Acts chapter 15, from verses 14, it says, Shimon has declared, so Acts chapter 15 from verse 14 to 15, Shimon had declared how Alua first visited the nations to take out of them a people for his name. So understand, he has visited the nations. Now even Moab is part of the nations, but out of the nations he has brought a remnant. 
So there shall be a remnant that will come out of the nation. So even out of Moab, there will be a nation. There will be a remnant. Father will always have a remnant. A remnant that will bow their knee to him. A remnant that will truly repent and see their wicked way and say, we have realized we have gone astray and we want to return. And the words of the prof of the prophets agree with this, as it has been written. Now listen to how beautiful. And after this I shall return and rebuild the booth of David. Now remember what he's just spoken in verse 5 of Isaiah, chapter 16, verse 5. And after this I shall return and rebuild the booth of David, which has fallen down. And I shall rebuild its ruins, and I shall set it up. So that the remnant of mankind, see, that there be a remnant of mankind, shall seek Yahuwah. So just like Ruth was a Moabite, but she seeked Yahuwah, she bowed her knee and she said, your people will be my people and your Yah will be my Yah. So she was willing to take on the Yah of Avram, Yitzhak and Yaakov. She was willing to bow her knee to a covenant. And the remnant of mankind shall seek Yahuwah, even all the nations on whom my name has been called, says Yahuwah. Who is doing all this? Who has made this known from of old? Praise Abba. So this is what the Father says, that there will be a remnant of mankind shall seek Yahuwah. So you see, this is what Isaiah is busy seeing Yah when he says, And in loving commitment the throne shall be established, one shall sit on it in truth. So you see, he's going to judge in truth. And that's why it's so important that right now we are coming back to truth. Everything that is not truth will fall. Everything that is not truth will be shaken. Because he wants truth in our innermost parts. In the tent of David, judging and seeking. So he's judging and he's seeking at the same time. As his judgments are being unleashed, he is seeking for those that are going to bow their knee to him. And speeding righteousness. So he's seeking, as he's judging, to see who is seeking him. Who is bowing their knee? So we continue to read. We have heard of the pride of Moab, very proud of his pride, his arrogance and his rage. His boastings, his boastings are not true. So Moab wells, for Moab everyone wells, for the raisin cakes of Okir, Haresh, Haresh, wells, they moan, they are utterly smitten. So people will say, is this Moab, the proud land, all that people have acquired of their flesh? Its pride, its arrogance will be utterly destroyed. People will cry because of the destruction that they're going to see around them in their own cities, in their own nations. They are going to see much destruction. And you see, just like Moab, the nations of the world all pride themselves in their great armies, in their great power of all that they have acquired of the arm of the flesh. But the day will come when all is going to shake and only that which has been founded on the rock is going to stand. Because he's going to shake the heavens and the earth. And every proud and arrogant thing that man has raised up is going to be shaken and destroyed. And so he 
co we continue to read verses 8 for the fields of Heshbon languish the vine of, of Sibma the masters of the nations have broken down its choice plants which have reached to Yazer and wandered through the wilderness her branches are stretched out they are gone over the sea this was a mighty nation whose branches stretched out over the sea. Therefore, I bewail the vine of Sibma with the weeping of Yazer. I water you with my tears, O Heshbon, and Al Elah. For acclamation have fallen over your summer fruit and your harvest. So we must understand that this was a nation, a very powerful nation, Moab was. And they had many vineyards. And their vineyards, their plants have been destroyed and trampled on by the rulers, the masters of the nations that have now come as they are being destroyed. Moab was like a very prospering vine. It was seen as a vine. What does a vine do? A vine stretches out its branches and it gives forth its lush, beautiful wine. And so they were so proud of their of their wealth that they obtained and so proud of all that they have acquired in their nation. And so Moab was like this prospering vine that spread out its wealth and gave wine to many around them with all their idolatrous ways. And is this not what many of the nations of the world are like? They pride themselves in their vineyards and in their orchards and all the fruit that they have. But the fruit that is the fruit of the actual fruit that they bear from themselves is nothing but treacherous and evil, idolatrous to its core of its being. It's self-centered and all about pride and arrogance and self-centeredness where man is on the throne of their own lives. And this is everything that Moab was representing. And so when we have a look at Jeremiah chapter 48, we go to Jeremiah chapter 48, and in Jeremiah chapter 48, verses 20, we have a look at this, and he says, Moab has been put to shame, for it has been broken down. Howl and cry. Let it be heard in Arnon that Moab is ravaged. And judgment, sorry, we are in Jeremiah chapter 48, verses 20 to 21. And judgment has come on the plain country, on Holon, and on Hatsa, and on Mof Mofath. And then if we go down to verse 25 and 26, it says, The horn of Moab has been cut off, and his arm has been broken, declares Yahuwah. You see, the horn of its arrogance, like the little horn that is going to come up. In the time of the book of Daniel, there will be that little horn that is going to raise up in absolute pride and arrogance. Verse 26 Make him drunk, because he has made himself great against Yahuwah. Moab shall splash in his vomit, and he shall also be in mockery. So understand, that is why the father raises up a remnant, a remnant that is willing to bow, because if we do not bow to Abba Yahuwah, we are part of these arrogant people in our flesh nature. Where it's all about me, myself and I. And the sad thing is that many people in the church think that just because they've received 
Jesus, they are all fine. But they live like the world, act like the world, look like the world, smell like the world, but they've received Jesus. And they do nothing of putting this word into practice. And so who is the master of their lives? Because if they are still the master of their lives, then the destruction of Abba Yahuwah will come upon them, just as it came upon anybody that is going to stand up against him and his ways. And so then he says, um, in verse 28, O inhabitants of Moab, leave the cities and dwell in the rock, and be like the dove making a nest in the sides of the cave. We have heard of the pride of Moab. He is very proud. So is this not what the kings of the world are like? The kings of the world pride themselves in what they have achieved in this life. The kings of the world pride themselves in all that they achieve, be it the doctors and the scientists and these people that now, in, at this point in time, want to rule the earth with a knowledge that comes out of books as opposed to sitting and reading the book the Bible, that is the only instruction manual that we actually need for, the, for our lives. And he says, we have heard of the pride of Moab. He's very proud of his loftiness and arrogance and pride and of the haughtiness of his heart. So you see, when our heart is haughty, when we actually pride ourselves in thinking that we can stand so right before the Father because we think that the Father is blessing us, but meantime, behind the scenes, never judge your right standing with the Father based on how he uses you because he will even use a donkey if he needs to. We need to humble ourselves before the Father and allow him to constantly expose our hearts are wicked. And who knows the arrogance and the pride of the heart except the Father? And that is why we need to fall on the rock and cry out to Abba Yahuwah for his mercy and his grace to show us what is there that is still not pleasing to him. And let us not be arrogant like Moab thinking, well, you know what, this is all I've achieved and everything is mine. And so then we continue to read as we're going to finish off. And it says, And gladness is taken away and joy from the orchard. In the vineyards there is no singing, no shouting, no treaders tread out wine in their presses. I have made their acclamation cease. Therefore my inward parts sound like a lyre for Moab and my inner being for Kir Heres. And it shall be when it is seen that Moab has wearied herself on the high place that she shall come to her set apart place to pray but not be able. And this is exactly what is going to happen with many people in these last days. Let's read what it says in Jeremiah chapter 48 verse 33 says, Joy and gladness have been taken away from the orchard and from the land of Moab and I have made wine to cease from the wine presses. No one treads with shouting and the shouting is no shouting. And so the wine that made merry and the wine that intoxicated and made drunk is going to be removed because you would want to be able to rely on your wine and on all your wine making to make you joyous and glad. It wasn't in me. Your joy did not come from your relationship with me or from you seeking me or from you walking in my ways. Your joy comes from an external source. So what is the father trying to say? Now listen to what he says in verse 35. 
and I shall make an end in Moab to him who offers in the high places and burns incense to his mighty ones, declares Yahuwah. So my heart sounds for Moab like flutes and my heart sounds for the men of Kir Heres like flutes. Therefore the wealth they made shall be gone. And so I've spoken this already that I'm saying everything that is of the arm of the flesh, if you have not used it for the Father's kingdom, it shall be gone. Because everything that he's given you is for the glory and the honor of his name. And so we must understand that there he speaks over here and he says, verse 12, and shall be when it is seen that Moab has wearied herself on the high places, that she shall come to, to her set apart place to pray, but not be able because we will shout and turn to the arm of our flesh and turn to all these things that we've put our trust and our faith in and it's not going to help us. So everything that you think that you've got there that is going to help you in those last days is not going to help you if you're putting your trust and your faith in the arm of the flesh. Nothing is going to help you because in Jeremiah chapter 17 let's just read what it says because this is just coming up in my spirit right now in jeremiah chapter 17 let's see what he said already when we read jeremiah about the arm of the flesh so we read and it says from verse 5 17 verse 5 thus said yahuwah cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his arm and whose heart is turned away from yahuwah for he shall be like a shrub in the desert and not see when good comes and shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness, a salt land that is not inhabited. Blessed is the man who trusts in Yahuwah, whose trust is in Yahuwah. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spread out its roots by the river and does not see when heat comes and his leaf shall be green. And in the year of drought, he is not anxious nor does he cease from yielding fruit. So you see, he will yield fruit, not his fruit will be cut down. And so we must understand that the Father is saying, there will be many that are going to cry out to him in that day and he will not hear their prayer because they did not seek him, because they did not they, they did not turn to him. He sent prophet after prophet after prophet to warn and they would not listen. He sent servant after servant after servant to speak, and he would not listen. And he was still filled with arrogance and pride, and did not bow his knee and turn to him. And because of that, there is going to be great destruction. And verse 13 says, This is the word which Yahuwah has spoken concerning Moab since that time. We're now back in Isaiah chapter 16 as we finish off verse 14. But now Yahuwah has spoken, saying, Within three years, as the years of a hired man, the esteem of Moab is to be despised, with all its great throng, and the remnant be few, small and weak. So the Father will have a remnant which will be few, small and weak. They will be weak because they will be humbled, and they will understand that there is one and only that they are to turn to, and that will be Abba Yahuwah. So may this be a lesson for us to understand that in the days that we live in, we are to put our trust in nothing other than Abba Yahuwah, and to understand that everything that we have is a grace from Him. And we can have it today and it can be gone tomorrow, because everything is His at the end of the day. And so may Abba bless you all and we praise Abba for his revelation in all things. May Abba bless you. Shalom, shalom.